Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Aditya Akela from UT Austin. I'm the chair for this uh, session on congestion control, a classical topic for our community that uh, keeps having a rebirth every few years, and, and these days, every year at SIGCOM. So we have four excellent uh, papers, sort of, on this topic. Uh, our first uh, paper is uh, going to be a video presentation. Uh, uh, the author is here. Uh, the author is uh, Chen Yu Yan. He's a final year PhD student supervised by Jonathan Chow. Uh, he works on reinforcement learning and congestion control. He's generally interested in applying machine learning and understanding the best ways to apply machine learning to networking problems. Um, he's on the academic job market looking for full-time positions and, and postdoc positions as well. So, yeah. Hello everyone, this is Sohail, and I'm going to talk about our new work Sage, which is a collaboration with Chen Yu, Jonathan, and NYU. The presentation will have three parts. In the first part, I will focus on the context and motivation behind the work. Then, I will describe what research question we're targeting to answer here. Later on, I will try to elaborate a little bit more on the big picture of the design of Sage and how we approach the main research question that we have. So let's start with the context and motivation then. Congestion control, as you know, is one of the challenging and active research topics in the community. This statement has remained a valid one for many years. Here I'm showing you the number of published congestion control related papers in 16 ACM journals and conferences. And I hope that it can convince you that it's a hot topic. In particular, if we focus on the internet congestion control, the challenging aspect of it comes from different factors. The very first one is lack of perfect information. As you know, internet is based on the philosophy of dominant work, smart, and host. And congestion control is supposed to be done by the end host then. However, end hosts uh, don't have perfect information about the underlying network. Things like what is the exact delay of the network at different times, what is the capacity of different links, different button link links, and for instance, things like number of competing flows and so on and so forth. Another thing, which might be a little bit even more important than the first one, is the cooperative game uh, aspect of the condition control on the internet. It means that other entities also you know, are there. It's not just about your own local objective, but you need to also take care of some global objectives which show themselves in terms of you know, TCP friendliness or fairness and so on and so forth. All these and similar challenges have already led to different you know, congestion control designs out there. But unfortunately, a well-known lesson from decades of congestion control design and research is that every heuristic at the end of the day has its own issues. In other words, Existing schemes might be able to perform good in certain scenarios, but they will fail in the other ones. This is what I call the empty half of the class. Please feel free to check out the paper for some illustrative examples of this. We also can look into this uh, from another angle. If we focus more on the good aspect of the things and the fact that these existing schemes are actually the outcomes of the years of efforts and research you know, in this domain, we may come up with this idea that we already have a precious fast pool of congestion control designs out there. This is what I call the full half of the glass. That said, let's see what research questions we're targeting to answer in this work. What we already have in terms of you know, how to design a congestion control, a new one, is following this cycle. First, we always start with you know, investigating the existing schemes, trying to figure out the pros and cons of them, comparing them with each other, and so on and so forth. Then, designers will start thinking about how to improve them. So they come up with ideas, some of them will fail definitely, and some of them, maybe magically, you know, happen to work somehow. But the key thing in this cycle is that it's a manually executed one meaning different steps should be done manually. Because of that, it's very time consuming. We're talking about months or years of design. And also, because of that, we can say that it's not that sustainable. 
So this is what we already have, but we, what we desire to have is a more automated version of this. If I want to show you this in a cartoonish way, this would be something like this. We want to utilize the existing schemes, whether they're broken or not, doesn't matter. We're going to utilize them and automatically come up with a better you know, policy, with a better strategy. In other words, we're trying to automatically utilize the full half of the class, the fact that we have lots of different condition control schemes out there, to address the issues of the empty half of the class, which is you know, the problem with them in uh, different scenarios. And this brings the main qu research question that we try to answer here. Can computers learn from the existing congestion control schemes and automatically discover a better performing one? To answer this question, we designed Sage. So now I will you know, go through the big picture of the design and elaborate a little bit on that. Design of Sage consists of three phases. The first phase, we do collect congestion control policies. For example, Assume we're trying to collect TCP cubics behavior. We'll let different flows go through different network environments using TCP cubic, of course. And then we collect and record some general signals independent of TCP cubic or any congestion control scheme, to be honest. And then we filter them out and make a so-called data set of cubic representing its behavior in different you know, settings. Then you can imagine we add more schemes here, this will be Vegas and whatever scheme you like. And then at the end, we will get pool of policies, pool of existing policies. From this point on, we have the pool of policies fixed. So there wouldn't be any you know, interaction with any network environments. There wouldn't be any packets sent to any network environments. There wouldn't be any you know, extra exploration, if you like. We just have the, uh, the pool of policies and we just feed it into part of the system, which is data-driven reinforcement learning agent that we have. As a side note, Sage, as far as we know, is the first design utilizing data-driven or offline RL in the context of working. To see what is the, or what are the differences between data-driven RL and the general RL that you have heard likely in other works, please check out uh, our paper. So after the training, which is fully offline, is done, we get SAGE model, which is basically the basis of a deep neural network. Then we put SAGE in this new architecture. There are two extra components here. One is TCP pure. This is a minimal TCP that we have implemented uh, at the kernel side, and it tries to handle you know, general transport functionalities other than congestion control. When it comes to congestion control, TCP pure is a dummy one. It just executes the instructions given. The other component is general representation unit. Think about it as a shim layer to receive and enforce kernel signals and actions. And feel free to check out the public repository of the project for the details of the deployment. Okay, so let's go back to the main question that we wanted to answer. Here I will share with you one of the evaluations that we have. Of course, there are lots of more evaluations in the paper. And feel free to check them out. So what is the setting? We try to utilize 13 available congestion control schemes in the Linux kernel and train Sage for seven days and see what happens. X-axis here shows the training day. Y-axis shows winning rate. Winning rate is the percentage of times that the scheme was among the top performing schemes in the tested scenarios, meaning a higher number is a better one. So let's put 13 available congestion control schemes in this graph and showing you the winning rates of them. This would be something like that. But now let's add Sage to this graph. As you see, it starts from a very low number, but throughout the training days, it keeps growing and getting better and better. 
until day five that it actually surpasses the best performing new scheme in these uh, set of benchmarks. By the way, these are the benchmarks that we have and we have defined them in the paper for more details, you know, again, uh, please check out the paper. So the key here is, you know, the answer to the main question that we had, can computers learn solely from the existing, com existing condition control designs? Yes, indeed they can. And Sage is a sample showing uh, this fact. To wrap it up, let me just um, have a final note here and have one simple question. Is this the end of the story of internet congestion control research? Of course not. But we believe that Sage can show a more sustainable way to reach that end. Thanks for your attention. So we have time for a few questions. Thanks. So Quentin de Koning, University of Mons. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering, because you mentioned some network parameters and network environments, what do they mean? Do you mean that you explore different latencies, different, different delays, different applications? What do, what uh, do yes, you Yes, that's a good question. So the network environment here is to re refer to different settings of, of the network. For example, you can have different latency, different uh, bandwidth, or different loss parameters. So we kind of define a range of network parameter and use it for like the testing. Hi, uh, Hi. thank you. Uh, Shushavan from Rice. So I have a clarification question. So here is the goal to learn one god uh, scheme for congestion control and to use it for any single application? Or you have a pool of such policies and you use it or vary it based on your uh, like applications. Okay, that's a good question. So the final outcome here is a one single model. So we will use one single model for the evaluation. So and during learning, you will you try to learn the one single model for all different kind of testing, uh, different kind of network scenarios. Thank you. So maybe a last quick question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, um, uh, Tao Ji from UT Austin. My question is, when you train the, the model, you obviously get some uh, good uh, performance in terms of some objectives, but uh, what, how do you choose the objectives? And uh, are there any considerations um, in different, <coughs> say, environments? Okay, so generally the objective uh, in a congestion control can be defined as like, uh, you want to maximize your throughput and minimize your delay. So this is one objective we are considering in, for example, in a single flow scenarios. And when you're trying to compete with others, and this would refer to like TCP friendliness, and this would be like trying to get like some equal share of the bandwidth uh, regarding other flows. So these are some con uh, objective that we are considering. And we also show that the performance of different um, uh, objective uh, in the paper. Thank okay, you. let's thank the speaker once again. <clears throat> thank you. All right, our next speaker is uh, Saksham Agarwal. He's a PhD student at uh, Cornell University, advised by Rachit Agarwal. No relation. Uh, his research interests lie broadly in the intersection of systems, networking, and hardware. Uh, he'll be on the academic job market uh, this year, so if you're interested in recruiting in the space, please uh, talk to Saksham. Uh, and he's going to talk about not machine learning, congestion control. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so today I'll talk about congestion control, but for a completely new kind of congestion, host congestion, that is congestion within the host. 
In particular, I'll tell you a bit about how host congestion requires us to rethink the problem of congestion control. And I want to share with you what we have learned so far in terms of understanding host congestion and resolving host congestion. All right, let's jump right in. Let's jump right in. So conventionally, the conventional wisdom in our community is that congestion happens primarily in the network core, that is, at network switches. For instance, due to oversubscribed topologies, in-cast traffic patterns, poor load balancing, etc. However, several recent studies from large-scale production clusters have demonstrated a new phenomenon, emergence of congestion within the end hosts. Essentially, with the adoption of multi-100 gigabit access link bandwidths, coupled with relatively stagnant technology trends for resources within the host, for instance, cache sizes, memory bandwidths, memory access latencies, has led to the emergence of host congestion. For instance, a recent Hotnet study presented the evidence of host congestion in Google's large-scale production clusters. The figure here shows a scatter plot of link access bandwidth utilization on the x-axis and measured packet drop rates on the y-axis at the hosts. The colors denote the density of sample points. The purple color indicates large number of sample points. Specifically, even after using state-of-the-art congestion control protocols and user space network stacks, the servers in Google production clusters observed large number of packet drops even when the access link bandwidth was far from saturation. The first contribution of our paper is to reproduce this host congestion phenomenon but using an open source Linux network stack and DCTCP congestion control protocol. We observed that even at a small scale, host congestion can lead to up to 55% throughput degradation and several orders of magnitude of tail latency inflation. We have also open sourced our workloads, experimental setup, and infrastructure needed to reproduce our results so that the community can start exploring the problem of host congestion. To understand host congestion, we need to understand the host interconnect. Today's host interconnect comprises of three main components. First, the processor interconnect, which is used by the CPU cores to exchange information amongst themselves and to send read or write requests to DRAM. The peripheral interconnect, which is used by the NICs to send read or write requests to CPU cores or to DRAM and the memory interconnect, or specifically the memory controller, which intercepts these read or write requests from NICs or CPU cores and executes them on DRAM. Importantly, the peripheral interconnect connects to the processor and memory interconnect using an integrated I.O. controller, also known as the I.O. The host interconnect has two interesting properties. First, the host interconnect hardware guarantees losslessness using hop-by-hop -hop credit-based mechanisms. In particular, each of the processor, peripheral, and memory interconnect uses a hop-by-hop credit-based flow control mechanism to guarantee losslessness. And as we'll see, host congestion happens because of a poor interaction between, between these individual flow control mechanisms. The second property is that the host interconnect is shared by network applications and host local applications. Importantly, network applications use congestion control, but host local applications do not. Now I can tell you what I mean by host congestion. Just like any other network fabric, even the host interconnect is oversubscribed. For instance, traffic from host local and network application can contend for resources like the memory interconnect bandwidth, leading to contention at memory controller. But since the host interconnect is lossless, it leads to a back pressure all the way back to the neck, which results in queue buildup and eventually leading to packet drops at the neck. And this problem of host congestion is likely to even get worse over time. The amount of memory bandwidth over subscription due to the host local traffic has remained and is likely to continue remain, remaining stagnant over time. However, the amount of peripheral traffic, for instance, due to NICs or other PCI-attached accelerators, has been increasing at a much faster rate, therefore increasing the overall memory bandwidth over subscription. Our work takes the first step towards alleviating the app-level performance degradation in the regime of host congestion. 
Host congestion requires us to rethink the existing congestion control architectures along multiple dimensions. First, we must rethink the congestion signals used to capture host congestion. Host congestion occurs due to queuing at resources like the memory controller, which is typically considered outside the network by traditional CC architectures. Further, the interaction between the lossless host interconnect and the lossy network fabric further complicates the challenge of collecting the right congestion signal. And indeed, the traditional congestion signals like switch buffer occupancy or packet drops can fail to capture the precise time, location, and reason of host congestion. We must also rethink congestion response for host congestion. This is because of two main reasons. The first reason is that the host local traffic today does not employ congestion control mechanisms. Therefore, the existing congestion control protocols that assume that all competing traffic adheres to congestion control protocols can lead to starvation for network traffic. The second reason is that the host local traffic can, is, is situated much closer to the point of congestion and can change dramatically at sub-microsecond time scales. Therefore, existing CC protocols that operate at a network RTT granularity can lead to performance which is far from optimal in host congestion regimes. Host CC is a new congestion control architecture that handles host congestion along with network congestion. The key idea in host CC is a sub-RTT granularity host local congestion response. This idea builds upon the conceptual view of congestion control, that is, allocating resources between the competing entities. So host CC's host local congestion response allocates host resources between network traffic and host local traffic. At the center, host CC's host local congestion response ensures that the network traffic is not starved, even at sub-RTT granularity. At the receiver, host CC's host local congestion response minimizes queuing and packet drops at the host. It modulates the host resources allocated to the network traffic at sub-RTT granularity, such that the NIC queues are drained at the same rate at which the packets are arriving to the NIC. I'll now provide a one-slide description of some of the most important details in host CC architecture. First, in addition to classical congestion signals collected from the network fabric, host CC also collects host congestion signals at the host interconnect at sub-microsecond time scales. This allows host CC to precisely capture the time, location, and reason for host congestion. Specifically, host CC uses IO buffer occupancy as its host congestion signal. IO occupancy can be measured today on commodity hardware by simply reading a single hardware register. Therefore, host CC works today without any modifications to existing hardware. Second, host CC uses these host congestion signals to perform the host resource allocation between the network traffic and the host local traffic. Current host CC implementation enables the operators to specify any desired resource allocation policy and uses existing memory bandwidth allocation tools available on uh, today's hardware to perform this resource allocation. And again, uh, the memory bandwidth allocation tools, they provide multi-level back pressure mechanisms to the host local traffic to modulate its resources, and it can be updated by using a single hardware register, which is also available in commodity hardware, enabling host CC to work without any modifications to software or hardware. Host CC architecture does not dictate precise resource allocation policies for host resources. Just like network resource allocation mechanisms can use different policies, like maximum fairness, prioritization, et cetera, we envision host CC to embody various resource allocation policies by various implementations. And finally, host CC uses both host and network congestion signals to perform efficient network resource allocation at RTT timescales. The key insight is that the sending rate must be computed using the bottleneck, not just within the network, but also at the host interconnect. So to summarize, I talked about host CC, which, uh, which is a new congestion control architecture uh, that resolves host congestion along with network fabric congestion. Host CC evaluation, as presented in our paper, demonstrates minimal impact of host congestion, even when evaluated over large-scale set, uh, settings and workloads, including both host congestion and network congestion. The paper also provides more insights into how different techniques used in host, host CC contributes to its observed benefits. 
We also talk about lots of lessons learned during the journey of our project. I finally want to conclude with a meta point. The emergence of the host congestion problem has opened doors for the community to explore many new intriguing questions which are on the boundaries of computer architecture, computer networking, and operating systems. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Wei Tao from RISE. Uh, very nice talk. My question is that um, the CPU applications also will use memory bandwidth, and it's usually unexpected traffic. So does host CC also consider those kind of memory bandwidth taken by CPUs applications, I mean? Uh, right, so when I mentioned host local traffic, that was precisely the memory bandwidth consumed by the CPU traffic. Uh, so when I mentioned host local applications, uh, what I meant was it's the traffic coming from the CPU cores going to the memory bandwidth, uh, going to the memory. I see, but um, for a normal CC, it usually take times to converge, but if you CPU has unexpected traffic, that will block the traffic from the network side. Is that true or? So, uh, so that was the key design insight that uh, to, to allocate resources for the CPU traffic, we perform this resource allocation at sub-RTD timescales. So even if the CPU traffic changes very rapidly, the congestion response to limit, to rate limit the CPU traffic to, to the desired rate based on the resource allocation policy also takes place quickly at a sub RTD time scales. Uh, hi there, I'm uh, Roman from Huawei. You talked uh, about congestions on the way from uh, uh, NIC to, uh, to memory through the CPU. But how do you relate this work to the RDMA, remote uh, memory right. access? Thanks. That's a good question. So RDMA does elevate to a problem to a certain degree by reducing the memory bandwidth utilization because of zero copy. But it still does not fundamentally resolve the problem because the network traffic still has to traverse the congested memory interconnect uh, because of DMA operations. And in fact, we have some preliminary results showing host congestion for RDMA traffic as well. Happy to talk offline to provide more detail. Great question. Uh, Eugene Ng from Rice University. So my understanding is that host CC is orthogonal to the network CC. Um, so my question to you is, looking at the bigger picture, is there any uh, hope that we can have a single CC algorithm that works end-to-end, -end, including you know, host and network level congestion? Uh, actually, uh, the current host CC architecture is what you just described. So it works end-to-end, -end, including both network CC and host, uh, and host local congestion response. So we use unmodified network congestion control protocols, which take into account both congestions happening within the network and the congestion happening at the host local resources as well. And so what's the signal that you use uh, that combines both network and host CC? Yeah, for example, the current host CC implementation uh, uses uh, ECN signals. Uh, so based on the IO buffer occupancy, we can generate the ECN signals to work with DCTCP, but the architecture does not limit us to any specific signals. We could also use delay-based signals for delay-based congestion control protocols in the future. Okay, let's thank Saksham once again. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Raj Joshi. He recently obtained his PhD in computer science from the, the National Un University of Singapore. Uh, his research spans fault-tolerant network infrastructure, network monitoring, and 5G RAN. He is currently on the job market and is looking for US-based research positions in industry and academia, uh, as well as postdocs. Uh, and he'll be presenting today the last portion of his PhD thesis. Morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Aditya, for the introduction. Um, so today I'll be talking about masking corruption packet losses in data center networks using link local retransmission. Uh, this is a joint work with my collaborators, Chawan, Shinzo, Nishant, Ayush, and my advisors, Manchun and Ben. Uh, before I start, uh, this talk is not about congestion control. This is more about uh, network infrastructure reliability. So 
Packet loss in data center networks is an important problem. It is very well known that packet loss degrades application performance and that has a direct impact on revenue. Now packet loss is mainly caused by congestion as well as link local corruption which occurs on optical links in large warehouse scale data centers. As you might be aware, there has been significant prior work to mitigate the effects of packet loss due to congestion, but not so much due to link local corruption. So in this paper, we'll be focusing on how to mitigate the impact of corruption packet loss. So why do we care about corruption packet loss? It turns out that in practice, corruption packet loss can be significant. A large scale study by Microsoft consisting of 350,000 links across 15 data centers showed that the number of packets that are lost due to corruption are comparable to those lost due to congestion. Another study by Alibaba Cloud showed that about 18% of the packet drops that seriously affected their cloud customers were caused due to corruption. And like any other packet loss, corruption packet loss leads to increase in tail flow completion times as well as drop in throughput. So how can we fix corruption packet loss? Well, performing a physical repair of the optical link, which is corrupting packets, is the only true way to fix it. But this can take between several hours to days. And until then, what we can do is mainly mitigate or mask the effects of corruption packet loss. Now, there has been some prior work in mitigating corruption packet loss, where the state-of-the-art approach is to disable the corrupting links. The main drawback of this approach is that all the corrupting links cannot be disabled because of network capacity constraints. So data from Microsoft data center shows that about 15% of the links just cannot be disabled due to capacity constraints. In our work, we revisit the classical loss recovery strategy of link local retransmission because it does not face from these limitation. Now, link local retransmission is not a new idea and it has been widely uh, deployed uh, in wireless networks today. But to the best of our knowledge, it has not been revisited in the context of data center networks. And we believe this is because of challenges that are unique to the data center context. To understand why is it challenging to do link local retransmission in a data center network, uh, let's look at an uh, example network. The link here between switch two and switch three is corrupting packets. Now I'm going to explain you a basic link local retransmission scheme, which can be imagined as a protocol that runs between a sender switch and a receiver switch. And the idea is very simple, right? The sender switch simply adds sequence numbers to the packets that are being sent on the corrupting link and also makes copies of these packets and buffers them. Now suppose packet number two is lost due to corruption, then the receiver switch can detect the same based on the missing sequence number. And it can inform the sender that packet two was lost and everything was received as packet number four. And the sender will retransmit packet two with higher priority and will drop the copies of the packets that are successfully delivered. This works. Uh, but it's insufficient in the context of data center networks. Why? For starters, this very simple scheme does not preserve packet ordering. In today's data center networks, one of the challenge is, to, is the use of RDMA flows, which are very sensitive to packet reordering. Any small amount of packet reordering can significantly degrade the FCD performance for RDMA flows. Therefore, we need to be able to preserve packet ordering and do so at high link speeds. The other challenge comes from the fact that switches in data center networks use shallow buffers, and so we need to keep any buffer overhead to the minimum. And finally, the third challenge comes from the fact that flows in data center networks are short. So when a short flow faces corruption, there is a high probability that the tail or the last packet is lost because there are simply very few amount of packets. In this example, um, the short flow of four packets is losing the last packet. Now, because the receiver detects this loss based on the missing sequence number, it's unable to, oops, it's unable to detect this until a subsequent packet is transmitted on this link. And this packet could be transmitted after an arbitrary amount of delay. And in such situations, we basically uh, have a retransmission timeout for the end-to-end -end transport, which leads to high flow completion times. So basically, we need to be able to de detect and recover these tail packet losses and do so as quickly as possible. So in this paper, we propose LingGuardian in order to address these three challenges. We use the basic link local retransmission scheme that I just explained, and then we build three key techniques on top of this basic scheme in order to address the three challenges. In this talk, I'll be talking about LingGuardian's technique to deal with the tail packet loss, and for other techniques, you can refer to our paper. So how does LingGuardian handle tail packet loss? Um, in this figure, I'm basically showing you the internals of a LingGuardian sender switch, 
which would normally just have two queues, one for normal packets and another for sending high priority, uh, retransmission packets with higher priority. Now, when a tail packet loss occurs, basically the normal traffic goes idle and the latest transmitted packet on the link is lost. The standard approach to deal with such a situation is to retransmit the unacknowledged packet after a timeout. The issue with timeouts is that we need to set these very conservatively, otherwise we risk furious retransmissions. And to avoid this, uh, in, in Link Guardian, we basically take a timeoutless approach. Our key idea is that if we can send a dummy link local packet when the traffic goes idle, then we can have the receiver switch to detect the tail packet loss. And to do so, we add another lowest priority queue that consists of a single dummy packet. Now, whenever there is normal traffic, this queue will be automatically paused because it's strict low priority. However, when the traf normal traffic goes idle and then there is a tail packet loss, this queue is automatically resumed. At this point, we add the next sequence number to this packet and transmit it on the corrupting link. We also make a copy of the dummy packet and put it back into the dummy packet queue. Now, this dummy packet basically allows a receiver switch to detect the tail packet loss, while the copy helps us to replenish the queue for any future tail loss detection. The beauty of this approach is that tail losses are detected near instantaneously and there is no extra overhead in doing so because dummy packets are sent only when the link is idle. Link Guardian is implemented on an Intel Tofino programmable switch in around 1800 lines of P4 code and we evaluate it on Intel Tofino switches and Xeon servers with 100 GNX. We also use a specialized equipment called the Variable Optical Attenuator to introduce a loss rate of 10 to the power minus 3. For evaluation, we consider two variants of Link Guardian. One is a default Link Guardian that preserves packet ordering, and another is Link Guardian NB or non blocking. It's essentially a light version of Link Guardian, which does everything that Link Guardian does except preserving packet ordering. Here I show you the main result uh, of our um, evaluation, which is that Link Guardian improves the tail flow completion times for TCP, specifically DC TCP. So the graph here shows the CDF of flow completion time for 24 KB flows when there is no loss. When we introduce a corruption packet loss of 10 to the power minus 3, we can clearly see a long tail for the FCT distribution. However, when we enable Link Guardian on this link, we can see that it improves the 99.9 percentile FCT by 19 times, and the, the overall distribution of FCT nearly matches the no loss case. For Link Guardian non blocking, which is not preserving orders, surprisingly, we see that there is nearly the same amount of improvement even if you are not maintaining packet ordering. The reason for this is that when TCP flows are short, any reduction in congestion window due to out of order retransmission has a minimal impact. We provide more detailed analysis on this result in the paper. As for RDMA flows, Link Guardian improves the 99.9 .9 percentile FCT by 39 times and we provide more detailed RDMA results in the paper. The main cost of Link Guardian is the packet buffer that it uses to buffer packets. And in the figure here, I show its packet buffer consumption for a stress test running 100G line rate traffic. We can see that Link Guardian consumes less than 90 KB of packet buffer on both sender and receiver switches. As for Link Guardian non-blocking, it requires only less than 25 KB of packet buffer on sender switch and it does not require any kind of packet buffer on the receiver switch because it is not preserving packet ordering. To put this result in context, switches today have tens of megabytes of packet buffer. So to summarize, in this paper, uh, we propose Link Guardian to mitigate corruption packet loss by performing selective in-network recovery at sub-RTT timescale. Link Guardian handles tail packet loss without employing any timeouts, and it is able to preserve packet ordering for reordering sensitive RDMA flows. Overall, in this paper, we demonstrate that link local retransmission is both practical and effective in today's data center networks, and that out of order retransmission is sufficient for short TCP flows. Thank you, and I'm happy to take more questions. Hi. Thanks. Nice. Hi, I'm Tom from Columbia. Hi. There was a paper about 10 years ago from Google uh, where they were kind of retransmitting re the last packet in a TCP flow mm -hmm. to, again, encourage that detection of the loss. Right. Is there a place where you see this as more useful than that, or like is one better in each setting? 
Right, so actually recently they have uh, also introduced an RFC to do that, where they kind of optimize on TCP's end-to-end uh, -end retransmission mechanism. However, the scale is very different. The, they still have to rely on timeouts because they are not sure whether the packet is, is lost. So they do retransmit at millisecond scale. Being locally at the link, we're able to actually detect this near instantaneously and do it at uh, sub-RTT scales. So in, in that scheme, in any end-to-end -end scheme, fundamentally are limited by one RTT. Hi, this is Mahmoud from Huawei. Okay. Very interesting work. Hey, yeah. Yes. So uh, I, will, I have a question regarding the buffering as a switches. You are doing the retransmission from the switch to, one, to the other switch. Right. So how do you have any calculation or any estimation of the buffer required at the switch? Are you going to do 100% buffering for all packets until you receive the acknowledge? or how you are going to do this part exactly? Yeah, so I did not talk much about buffering. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, before we send a packet on the link, we uh, create a copy of the packet, and uh, we have to use the packet buffer. The, the way to keep buffer occupancy low is that we need to have an acknowledgement as fast as possible from the other side. Sorry? Yes, it's a copy of the packet that we are holding. And once we get act, we basically drop the copies of the packets. And the key is to get those acts fast and also efficient. And there are more details in the paper uh, on how to do that and keep buffer occupancy low. Last quick question. Hi. Uh, this is Jashin Ling from UT Austin. Hi. Uh, I have a quick question. Like, how sh should you handle multiple flow? Like, Sorry, there is a case that the link, for example, uh, fr the, the flow one is end, but the link is occupied by another flow. So you cannot send the dummy packets through the idle link. So how are you handling this case? Okay, so we don't operate at flow level, we operate at link level. So when we put sequence numbers, these sequence numbers, the series can be applied to packets across flows. So even if there is one flow that has ended and is another flow that is starting, it might just help us to detect the, the packet loss because of uh, allowing a sequence number gas. So sequence numbers are link local or to a particular port. They're not flow level. We can talk more offline if this is not clear. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, we can talk offline. Okay, let's thank the speaker once again. Our last speaker for this session is Crystal Wu. She's a PhD student from Rice University, um, advised by Eugene Ng. Uh, her research interests focus on uh, reducing traffic inter interference and improving network performance in shared data centers, including network monitoring, congestion control, and performance isolation. Yes, thank you, DTF, for introduction. In this talk, I have to introduce our work, Augmented Q, an in-network abstraction for network sharing to provide precise bandwidth guarantees among different traffic constituents. It's a joint work with my colleague, Zhuang Wang and Wei Tao Wang, advised by our professor, Eugene Ying. In today's data centers, network infrastructure is shared among different traffic, and different traffic can interfere with each other. They can make different contributions to the network congestion, and here we show several examples. In the first scenario, the aggressive application injects UDP bus traffic to the network. It can monopolize the bandwidth and therefore stop the gentle application's TCP traffic. In the second scenario, the aggressive application opens multiple flow connections, so it can grab more bandwidth than the gentle application on the bottleneck. And in the third scenario, different tenants use different connection control algorithms. However, Different connection algorithms cannot coexist gracefully. They have different performance requirements, such as high utilization and low latency. And some CC algorithms can be more aggressive than the others, and therefore they can obtain more bandwidth, and the throughput will overwhelm others. As a result, the network fabric can be unfairly shared, leading to unpredictable network performance degradation. The root cause of the network interference and the unfair sharing is the reliance on physical queues. Aggregate traffic is buffered and transmitted by a small number of, or sometimes even just one physical queue. Such physical queues is shared by all the traffic passing through them, regardless of the applications and the control algorithms they used. Or P here with different color represents packets from different entities. So when there's congestion, there's no distinguish between the traffic, different traffic contributions. And also, one needs to send the signals to the senders to the risk control. 
It cannot provide different types of canine signals simultaneously. To provide better network sharing, we propose augmented Q, the AQ. And one of the key interesting designs is that we rethink what to use for traffic control. A key question here is that, do we really need to rely on the physical information to trigger the traffic control? Definitely the answer is no, and we use a concept termed discrepancy for each entity inside. Such discrepancy is provided based on insights that the traffic control of an entity should be only determined by its own traffic. Concretely, it depends on the allocated rate of an entity and the traffic arrival rate. Here we show an intuition of the discrepancy. Assume there are three entities sharing the network with the same allocated rate 10 gigabits. At a time point, the traffic rate can be different, ranging from 10 gigabits to 20 gigabits. The discrepancy can be expressed as how many packets ought to be waiting in a 10 gigabit streaming queue. And here you can see, for entity one, the allocated rate is equal to the arrival rate. So there's no canine signal sound. However, for entity two and three, their arrival rate is larger than the allocated rate. Although here, the physical queue length can still be zero because the link capacity is large and the link is not fully saturated. The kinetic signals can be generated, and now it's based on the discrepancy rather than the physical queuing. So based on these insights, AQ devised a mathematical model to properly measure the discrepancy. As shown here, the discrepancy is calculated based on the integral of the traffic arrival rate and the allocated rate. Such integral over time should be smaller than arbitrary small number to make sure that the arrival rate can be converged to the allocated rate. And we also need to make sure that the discrepancy can be positive, making sure that we can minimize the rate of oscillation. So in this way, we can reduce the traffic burst, and the maximum traffic rate can keep as the same as zero at each cycle. And as a result, we can make sure that it will not keep increasing at each adjustment cycle. Furthermore, AQ distance streaming algorithms to control the traffic rate at the packet level. Recall that the previous mathematical model is defined as the granularity of traffic rate. However, in practice, traffic is arrived packet by packet. So we conduct a mapping from the traffic rate to a packet sequence. And at the time point, the rate can be inflected by the packet size and the arrival time intervals between different packets. And based on these insights, we convert the mathematical model from the continuous domain at the rate level to the discrete domain at the packet level. The discrepancy is updated at the arrival of each packet and is determined by the discrepancy of last packet and uh, how much can be drained during the time intervals. Another interesting part of AQP design starts it decouples the generation of the network feedback from the physical queues. So now the network feedback is generated separately based on different discrepancies of different entities and different types of signals can be used simultaneously for traffic control. As shown here, different entities sharing a physical queue can have its own AQ. And when packets arrive at the switch, AQ will force compute the discrepancy for different CC algorithms. And different CC algorithms can generate different types of CC signals simultaneously. For example, if the discrepancy of an AQ exceeds a limit, such packet will be dropped. If otherwise, if it exceeds an instant threshold for entity using the ECN based CC, such packets will be marked as ECN. And for delay based CC, we will pick up the queuing delay to the packet header, and such delay information will be updated along the path. And in this way, different traffic can control their traffic rate separately. Note that AQ is just a mathematical queue that just used a few computation to mimic the queuing behaviors independently. It actually stores no packets, but can make sure that the traffic can behave as if it was running in an inclusive network. Traffic passing through multiple AQs can share one physical queue, so we are not restricted by the number of physical queues in practice. And with these properties, AQ can scale to production data centers. For example, 1.4 megabits memory is enough for 100,000 AQs with a wide range of bandwidth granularity from megabits to one gigabits. 
to evaluate the AQ, we prototype it on both the answer simulator and the final test byte. One evaluation highlight is that AQ can bound a difference of shared bandwidth. We measure the throughput of different CC settings, and the ideal goal is to equally fail share the network. Without AQ, the Ethereum based CC like GCTSP can unfairly capture more bandwidth than the job based CC like Cubic and Reno. And similarly, both job based CC and Ethereum based CC can stop the delay based CC like Swift. And also, UDP traffic can always monopolize the bandwidth. On the other hand, AQ can guarantee the network can be fairly shared all the time. Another point is that AQ can accommodate actual traffic patterns. Here we show both the workload completion time and the energy fairness when different VMs have different traffic patterns. We can observe that AQ has shorter completion time than the two kinds of very limited solutions, and we can fully utilize uh, the bandwidth even under dynamic traffic volume changes. For fairness, however, it's better. AQ improves the fairness and the different number of VMs and the benefits becomes more obvious when the number of VMs increases. In summary, AQ is an in-network abstraction for better network sharing that reduces the reliance on physical queues. It can differentiate traffic from different entities and control the traffic separately based on different network feedback. It provides precise benefits guarantees for different traffic constituents across the application layer, transport layer, and the link layer. So know that AQ is not just related to the congestion control, but also trying to provide the performance isolation. Just due to the time limits, there are several other interesting aspects now involved here. For example, AQ targets more user cases, like the inbound and outbound bandwidth guarantees for VMs, dealing with other physical natures and limitations. And based on different scenarios, AQ can be applied at either the ingress pipeline or the egress pipeline, or the both sides. We also provide more analysis to justify the design choices for described measurements as well as the evaluation results. Yeah, so there are more other details in our paper, and if you are interested, feel free to check out our paper for more details. That's all of my talk. Thank you all. Uh, I'm Wenfei Wu from Peking University. Thanks for the talk. So I have a question. Each packet uh, needs to retrieve its EQ states and update it. So if there is 100,000 EQs, how do you design this data structure for quick retrieval and update? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So EQ is not aimed for like different packets, but aims for like different entities. So that it's possible that there are like 1,000 like, uh, EQs in the switches. So it depends on so we just use a few computations to do the register uh, and to update, the, to update and calculate how much the discrepancy is it. So it's not a big uh, computation and the memory conception. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Zuri Guo from UW Medicine. I have a quick question for you. Um, like AQ is send congestion control signal earlier, so will it hurt the overall bandwidth for all the traffic? Actually, it will not. So AQ is trying to provide the precise bandwidth guarantees for the allocated, band, uh, the allocated bandwidth. So each entity will require its own allocated bandwidth. So we can, in our analysis and evaluation, we can prove that we can achieve the full utilization of the allocated bandwidth. And what, I think what do you mean is for the work conservation of the whole uh, link capacity over the network. So for that part, AQ uh, is contributed to our several cases uh, of the AQ. But the AQ can be easily to extend it, where you can enable and disable AQ at different time points to make sure that the link can be fully utilized all the time. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Crystal. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to invite the authors and presenters onto the stage for our panel. We have about maybe seven or eight minutes.
So like in other sessions, this is an opportunity for you to ask additional questions, but also for the speakers to maybe refer to each other's papers and reflect on what they learned. So maybe I'll go first. So um, I have a question for Chen Yu. So you did show your benchmark graph uh, where your RL basically improves your uh, CC performance over the, over, over, as the days pass. So is there a situation or scenario you think where uh, the condition control um, or whatever the network conditions could change in a way that your performance could drop before the RL could learn or will the graph always go in an improving, improving trend? Uh, so regarding, I, I think this is a good question. So, so the, the, in the training in this case, like uh, we look at like multiple scenarios. So in the data collection phase, we have like have multiple different network scenarios. So during training is trying to figure out either any kind of schemes perform bad or perform good in that scenarios. So from the RL perspective, it's trying to find a better policy. They're trying to explore exploit those kind of bad scenario and good scenario to come up with better policy that can perform good in those cases. And regarding like whether there will be like some future cases like the mechanism that can work, I think this would be like a good question to investigate how the robust performance regarding those kinds of machine learning based performance. And I think this will require like more deployment in the real world to further understand its limitations. Oh, yeah, I have a follow-up question, like how generalized this like such policy is. Uh, is it related to like uh, the generalization of the like, data-driven IL, or is there any other assumptions for that? Uh, yeah, so generalization, I think, is a very uh, interesting and important question, and it also like is a active research a question in either machine learning community or networking community. And here we show that the performance can the trend policy can perform well in a wide range of settings. And this wide range of settings that includes some uh, lab test benchmark and also some internet scenarios. And so I think like during the training, it does not see those kind of internet scenarios, but we show that it can do good in those scenarios. Um, um, hi, I have a question for Raj. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, this is a way from Rice. Um, I think your work, uh, well, the transmission as a link, uh, local side, right? But um, the link local retransmission will also take in bandwidth. So it seems like if the connection control algorithm could handle the transmission and retransmit at the center side, mm -hmm. the overall throughput should be the same with the link right. local retransmission. Right. I mean that's that's another approach where I mean I, I mean the. The core fundamental issue is that the congestion, endpoint congestion control sees a loss, but it doesn't know whether this is, was a corruption loss or a congestion loss. And the default reaction is to reduce your rate, considering it as a congestion loss. So another angle could be that instead of doing um, in-network link local transmission, if we could signal um, to the endpoint congestion control that, hey, this was actually a corruption loss, don't react to it, just do a normal retransmission. Um, so this is possible, uh, but in, in our work, we, we kind of uh, had this um, idea in mind that the corruption is an infrastructure issue, and the infrastructure should take care of it. Uh, uh, and therefore, we are completely transparent to um, end host congestion control, because it would require changes on the, on the end host con uh, congestion control. And in terms of performance, obviously, um, if you are doing an end-to-end -end transmission, you have a minimum delay of one RTT. Um, by doing in-network, you can do sub-RTT. So performance-wise, um, I think uh, in-network would still remain strictly better. I see. Got it. Thank you. Hi. I am Venkat from UT. Hi. I have a question for all of you, including the Raj, the not congestion control people. <laughs> uh, what do you see is the end game for this field of research in the sense that we've been working on this forever, and the solution. <laughs> 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 so what should those papers say? Like, things keep getting more complicated. We keep looking at more and more complicated scenarios. So what might a potential fictional endgame look like? Actually, if I may, I'll ask uh, Saksham, because he hasn't had a chance to speak. And then the rest of you can talk. Go ahead, Saksham. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you know, <laughs> go ahead, answer the question. Fine. 
That's a good question. Um, <laughs> philosophically. Uh, one might also ask, like, why do we even care about an end game? If things keep getting complicated, we keep gonna getting new challenges, uh, new problems to solve as academics. It's great to have these challenges. Um, yeah, but I think, f at least I can tell from the whole CC uh, perspective, it's not like we completely redesigned the wheels. We saw this new problem, uh, but we actually went back to the drawing board and drew inspirations from what was taught to us many decades ago and just added some modifications so that it works today. So yeah, that's what I think. So maybe we might be revolving around drawing inspirations from the past, augmenting in the present so that it works for the future. But yeah, that's my take. My take is somewhat like, um, I like to draw parallels with software engineering, right? I mean, we're all engineers here. We don't write software and we just close down the team and the software is there, right? Eddie is still pushing commits to hot crap. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we need to maintain things and we need to keep fixing bugs. So, um, I guess uh, that's basically uh, how I look at it. That's the nature of things. Uh, things change, network speeds change. Um, we have problems on the host side and we just keep evolving and keep adapting. You have an answer. Oh. And my take is that uh, it's a challenging problem, but I think we can like use different kind of tools, like either from machine learning or different areas, to make a more sustainable way to think about the congestion control problem. Yeah, I have some feeling like. So it's still challenging and still keep improving. And the one thing is that we. Currently, we now like trying to rethink of the CC architectures or rethink of the how we can use the CC at different scenarios and even like different the coexistent problems. So it's something like there's still some like future design spaces that I realize on here. <laughs> um, I want to see if there are other questions. This is Mahmoud from Maui. It's a question for the for the people for the host uh, network. So I was actually interested in the effect if we apply BFC because the main issue is when you the credit base is pushing off too much on the queue, it causes a packet loss at the queue at the neck. So if we apply BFC, it should theoretically resolve the issue without getting too into more details. So it might be a good interesting point to consider this in a comparison or something. I'm not saying it will resolve it completely, but it might be. Yeah, I think you kind of also answered the question towards the end. Uh, it, it, it won't resolve the problem. Uh, and yeah, so like I was mentioning uh, a little earlier, we, we have some preliminary results using RDMA, where we use uh, PFC. And we do see, instead of packet drops, loads of PFC triggers. And yeah, you know the problems with PFC, head of line blocking, uh, congestion spreading. Um, so yeah, uh, it would be also interesting to perform a deeper study. Uh, 